Amen. If uh, one of these belongs to you, you stand up so they can see where you are, and y'all go sit with your family. Y'all have a happy Easter. Thank you so much for singing this morning. Amen. What a declaration to start off our service today, right? He is alive. Amen. In Matthew's account of the resurrection, the angel is speaking, and in Matthew chapter 28, verse 5, it says, But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen. Come see the place where he lay. He is risen as he said was what they said. And that's why we celebrate, not just on Easter Sunday, we celebrate every day that we have a living hope because we have a resurrected Savior. Look at somebody and tell them, say, He is alive. Now look at somebody else and tell them, He is alive. Amen. And we are here to celebrate Jesus. We are so glad that you chose to, to come to Flat Rock Baptist Church this morning. If you're a guest, we want to especially welcome you today and hope to serve you well. If you are a guest, wanted to point you out uh, that there are these little cards right back as you leave that door, right by a little church over there to the right. We'd love to have a record of your visit. Just put your name and address and phone number in any way we can serve you on there, and we would love to touch base with you in the days ahead. But it is great to see all of you here this morning. Hey, your shirts look great. Uh, if you got a shirt, man, y'all y'all wear it a lot better than your pastor, so I'll just tell you that. Y'all wear it a lot better than your pastor. But it is great this, uh, to see you this morning. I want to remind you, hey, we do have a few extra of these. These were shirts that our church sold uh, to have our mission statement on the back, and the purpose was this. We were raising money for our mission fund. We want to be a church that is a sending church that reaches out into our community and serves people with the gospel of Jesus Christ and the name of Jesus with the love of Jesus. And so if you are interested in getting one of those, we have a few extra. You can see my lovely bride at some point. So uh, we would love to have you get one of those if you, if you missed the first order. Uh, with mission opportunities, remember, uh, coming up, we have some awesome awesome ways to interact in our community. One of those is in uh, October, October 12th through the 23rd. I think there may be a slide for that. We are taking a mission trip to Uganda to work with Michael Seeger. If you're interested in that, uh, see me. There's also a couple interest meetings you can't see because the font is so light down at the bottom. But May 22nd and 29th, we'll get together for those that are interested. Then the deadline is June the 5th to be a part of that team. But we not just want to reach to the ends of the earth. We want to serve our community here, and there's some ways that you can do that in the days ahead. One of those is we have a community 5K run for a new playground at Hickory Flat. I just want to remind you, maybe you're a runner. Uh, there's some sign-up sheets in the back, some ways to register. wanted to make you aware that's coming up. Also looking for people to help serve that day. So if you want to bring fruit or water or want to be a part of that in any way to, to minister our community, you can see um, Jordan Thompson. He would love to tell you more about that. Then the last way you can minister today is this. I was asked to remind you that we have prayer grams on the back in the hallway. These are ways that we sign and just let folks know as they're going through tough times, we're praying for them. So if you come on a Sunday, you see those on that back table, uh, put your name down and we would love to have you uh, let people know that you're lifting them up. We, uh, we want to pray for one another, right? We want to encourage one another through prayer. And that is an awesome, awesome way to, to minister our community. Last announcement I have, then I'm going to get off the stage for a little bit. I know it's a lot is uh, if you're going to our women's retreat, uh, the, the Righteously Redeemed Women's Retreat next week, Miss Dorothy asked right after service, right over here, Miss Dorothy, just meet with her for a few minutes. She wants to make sure that, that you don't have any questions and uh, you, she gets everything answered for you. Uh, it's great to see you this morning. I'm excited about what God's going to do in our midst. So let's pray together as we, uh, as we enter into a time to sing praises to Jesus. Father, we come. Lord, as I drove here this morning, it was dreary, it was dark, it was spitting rain. Lord, um, I imagine the, the disciples that, that, that Sunday, as they, as they went to the tomb, their, their souls, their hearts were in that same condition, just not knowing what had happened, questioning things, wondering why it had happened. But then, Lord, everything changed because they got there and the tomb was empty. And Lord, we, we know that Jesus is alive. Lord, so as we sing today, may we sing to our risen King. As we open your word today, Father, 
I pray that you will speak to us and shine a spotlight on your son. And Lord, may the gospel be proclaimed clearly and may lives be changed. God, I thank you for saving me. I thank you for loving me enough, God, to send your son to defeat sin and death for me. And Lord, if there's one here today that's never experienced that, I pray today is the day of salvation. Lord, now as we sing, as we study, Lord, I pray that you'll meet with us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hey, Amen. We're so glad that you're here on this Easter Sunday morning. It's not so sunny, but it's a beautiful spring day uh, or, or b- because of what we celebrate here. It must be spring. Uh, flowers are blooming. Things are thawing. And I saw a polar bear sitting outside the door out there as I attempted to come into the church. Anybody see that thing? But it's a sweet old polar bear. Anybody wants to take that polar bear home, you pray about that. Let's stand today as we sing about a resurrected Savior. Dustin, I bet that Ben and I, white and yellow, are going to be a little loud after those kids sing, okay? Low in the grave he lay, Jesus my Savior, my Lord. Up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph for his foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ. my Savior He tore the bars away Jesus my Lord Up from the grave He arose with a mighty triumph for His foes He arose a victor from the dark domain and he lives forever with the saints to reign he arose he arose hallelujah christ serve a risen Savior. He's in my world today. I know that He is living, whatever men may say. I see His hands of mercy. I hear His voice of cheer. And just the time I need Him, He's always near. He lives, He lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, He lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know He lives. He lives with Rejoice, rejoice, O Christian, lift up your voice and sing. Eternal hallelujahs to Jesus Christ the King, the hope of all who seek Him, the help of all who find. None other is so loving, so good and kind. He lives, He lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. 
He lives, He lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know He lives. He lives within my heart. Amen. God sent His Son. They called Him Christ. 
Christ is Lord. You may be seated, but if you know this song, we invite you to sing out. Stand up if you won't. Raise your hands. Sing with us. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written, Jesus Christ, my
Amen. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we come. I just want to say, blessed be your name. Who has given us a living hope, as Peter says. Because Jesus rose from the dead. We know that hope is, is not wishful thinking. It's not, I, I hope I get to go to Disney World or I hope I get this for my birthday. It is a certainty. A fact. A hope we can bank on. Not because of us. But because of you. Because the, the tomb is empty. Because Christ defeated sin and death. So that we might have life. So Father, we praise you for that. Lord, we praise you that death has lost its grip on us. That whatever, whatever fear and, and anxiousness and worry and, and pain and struggle that, that we have today, we can come to you and know that everything changes because Jesus is alive. Lord, so I pray now that, that you will move in our midst. I, I pray now as we open your word, you'll speak clearly to us. I pray that you will not let it be anything I say, but God, you will, will speak your word through your spirit to your people to, uh, this, this morning. God, so that hearts are changed. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have a Bible, I want to invite you to turn to John chapter 19. John chapter 19. We're going to start in John chapter 19 and in verse 28, if you want to turn there. As you turn there, I want to ask you a question. Have you ever um, ha had something you say or your words been validated and you felt really good about it? Have you, ever, you know what I'm talking about? Where, where you've said something and maybe people struggled to believe or, or question the accuracy of your statement, but then later on it was validated or it was, it was proven and, and, and all of a sudden, you're like, yeah, yeah, I feel really good about it. Um, I'll tell you a story about my daughter, Adeline. Adeline, raise your hand. You don't have to stand up. Adeline, raise your hand. There's my daughter. Uh, she's eight. But um, it was funny. A few years ago, we were in our, in our house in Ekru, and um, Adeline told us one day, she said, uh, Mommy, Daddy, she said, I saw a snake. I saw a snake in the, in the fireplace. And uh, we told her, we were like, no, there's no snake in the fireplace. Um, you're just making that up. We're, you know, you were five, six years old at the time. We, we didn't believe her. Uh, snake in the fireplace? No, there's not one there. Um, well, a few days passed, and she came back to us again, and she said, I saw a snake in the fireplace. So I sat down as a good father, and I, I talked to her about, like, the boy who cried wolf. Anybody ever told that story to a child? Um, where you said, hey, don't make up stuff, you know, don't, don't lie because one day you may really be in trouble and, and, and there may really be a snake and we want to make sure we believe you, we want to make sure that you're telling the truth. And so I, I talked to her about that and, and got, got kind of forceful with her. She teared up. I felt bad as a dad, but I'm like, I've got to teach my daughter. She can't just go making stuff up. She can't just go saying things that aren't true. Well, a few days passed and she said, I, I saw a snake, Dad. Same thing. And so at that time, I'm like, dad, dad, you know, dad muscles comes on. You're like, no, we, we can't have this anymore. So I really kind of have a stern talk with her. No, we, we can't do that, Adeline. Um, and, and she tears up again. And I'm like, what's going on? I look in the attic, or I look in the, the fireplace. I look in the damper. There's nothing there. I'm like, where is this? What is she seeing? Maybe she's seeing a log, but she swears it's a snake. Well, we, we come one Saturday. Um, we just got to the house. I think we were changing clothes. It was after a wedding. After a wedding. So I'm in the, I'm in, I'm in the uh, bedroom changing clothes, getting into comfy clothes. And, and Oliver comes in. And he's big-eyed. Like, I'm talking big-eyed. And he said, Daddy, Daddy, there's a snake in the, in the fireplace. And I'm like, man, she's got him into it now. Like, that's what I'm thinking. I'm like... My kids are like, they're, everything I'm telling them, they're doing the exact, anybody ever feel like that? Everything you're telling your kids, they're doing the exact, I'm like, now my son's in on it, okay? And, and so I'm like, son, there's not. And he's like, there's a snake in the fireplace. So I walk out and I'm like, I'm going to go prove to him. I'm going to have the dad talk with him. There's no snake in the fireplace. And I go out there and I look at the fireplace 
And I look in the back of it, and there's this giant black snake hanging from the fireplace. And I go in there, Ashley's in there talking to Oliver, telling him not to say anything, you know, don't lie to your dad like your sister has. And I go in there, and I look at Ashley, and she looks at me, and she can tell by my face what I'm about to say. I just look at her, and I'm like, it's there. And so we proceeded over the next 30 minutes to try to, try to figure out how to get this snake out of the fireplace. I ended up, anybody a golfer? Anybody like playing golf? I like playing golf. You know what works really well with snakes is a pitching wedge. And so um, it's not just good from 100 in. It's good when you grab a snake and you pull it outside and you go bash its head in. And so I ended up doing that. You know, from the very beginning, snakes are our enemy. Um, and my wife told me, I said, let's just let it go. And she said, John Mark, I'm not sleeping in this house unless that snake is dead. She said, it got in here once, it can get back in here again. She said, I'm not sleeping in this house. But, but at that moment, you know what I had to do? I had to go to my daughter and I had to apologize. Because what happened in that moment is that the statements she had made to us, they were validated. They were proven. And, and because those statements proved, everything changed. I had to go apologize to her. She could look at me and say, I don't remember her doing it. She said, Daddy, I was right, wasn't I? <laughs> yes, daughter, you were right. Um, I get used to that in my house, telling the women that they're right. Um, guys, you understand that. <laughs> but... Um, but um, at that moment, everything changed because truth was validated. Truth was proven. And I want to sit here this morning and tell you, or stand here this morning and tell you, that on Easter Sunday, truth was validated. We've been going, if you haven't been with us over the past few weeks, for the past six weeks really, we've been walking through the Gospel of John. And put those statements up, Dustin. In the Gospel of John, you see a series of statements that Jesus makes and then validations to these truths that he makes. So we've seen that Jesus told the crowd he is the bread of life, that he is the only one who can truly satisfy that hunger. And you know what he did to prove it? He fed the 5,000. Truth, validation. We saw that Jesus says, I am the light of the world. I'm the light of the world. I'm the one that can drive out darkness and bring life. And then you know what he did to prove it? He brought sight to a blind man. Truth, validation. He said to, to Mary and Martha, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. Then what did he do? He brought Lazarus from the dead. And then there's these other statements that he makes. I am the door, the only way to eternal, abundant life. I am the good shepherd. I lay down my life for the sheep. I am the way, the truth, and the life. These incredible statements that Jesus has made throughout the Gospel of John to show us who He is. And you know what? Every time, He validates the statement. See, John's purpose of his Gospel, he wrote, and, and, and he wrote later than the other Gospel writers. Matthew, Mark, and Luke were kind of written around the same time. They were written for a specific purpose. And, and if you read them and you read John, it's a little different because John wrote because he wanted his people to know, his readers to know that Jesus is the Son of God. And he wanted them to believe and have life in his name. And so he, he uses a series of incredible claims of Christ and incredible miracles or signs of Christ to show us this, who Jesus is is. And so our goal in our study has been the same as that. We've wanted to see who Jesus is so that we can know Him deeper, to love Him more, to follow Him closer, and to live on His mission. The beautiful thing about John is this. It's building to today. As you read through his gospel, Jesus, at the very beginning, begins to make statements like this. Destroy this temple, and in three days, I'll rebuild it. 
And then throughout, he leaves these little seeds, even those statements just, just that we just talked about, that, that he is the life, that he's going to die but rise again. And then all of a sudden, we get to chapter 19, and that's where we're going to pick up today. And we're going to see that, that the whole gospel of John has been building to this moment that we celebrate on Easter Sunday. And so what I want us to do today is investigate the claims of Jesus by reading John's account of the crucifixion and the resurrection of Christ. And we're going to see five simple things really quickly today. So let's look at them together. We're going to see that Easter morning was the day that the claims of Christ were validated and what that means for us today. First truth we see is this. John chapter 19, verse 28 through 37. Let's read it together. John writes this, after this, so he's talking about the trial of Jesus. Jesus was arrested. He was hung on the cross, and he's, he's there hanging on the cross. And it says this, after this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said, to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. He bowed his head. He gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken, that they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with the spear, and at once there came out blood and water. He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth, that you may also believe. For these things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And again, another scripture says, they will look on him who they have pierced. So John, John takes us to this moment, sorry, takes us to this moment where Jesus is hanging on the cross and he's, he's dying. It, your, your text actually might headline it or, or tagline it, the, the death of Jesus. It's that moment where our Savior is hanging on the cross on, on Good Friday. And, and, he, and the first truth that I want us to see this morning is very simply that, that Jesus really died on a cross. Jesus Christ died on a cross. John makes very, very careful point to, to his readers that he was an eyewitness, doesn't he? Look at what he says. He was an eyewitness. He says that... <clears throat> He says, um, look at verse 35. He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true. He knows that he is telling the truth that you may believe. So, so John gets to this point and he wants his readers to know, hey, this really happened. You say, John Mark, why are you telling us that? I've heard that my whole life. Because I want you to understand this is not legend. This is not fable. This is not something that some man came up with. This is a historical fact that Jesus Christ died on the cross. Tension had, had risen over the past few weeks. The religious leaders sought to kill him. They, they didn't realize that Jesus had come to Jerusalem for that exact purpose, his death. Jesus spent those moments with his disciples. Judas betrayed him. He, he went to this mock trial and, and they hung him on the cross. And now John is giving us this picture of our Savior there on the cross. There's three things I want you to see that John tells us. The first is this. Jesus' death fulfilled Scripture. Notice he says that twice. He says that Scripture might be fulfilled. That Scripture might be fulfilled. In other words, John is telling his readers, this was the plan from the beginning. Why would he tell you that? Why would he want us to know that? Because he wants us to know that Jesus didn't die as a criminal. Jesus died as our Savior. That he willingly laid down his life. That it was God's plan from the Old Testament to now. It was God's plan from eternity past to now. That Jesus Christ died for not his sins as those back then would have been crucified for, but he died for our sins, according to the Scripture. That no one took his life, 
that he willingly gave it up. John wanted you to know that he's an eyewitness to the death of Jesus. He was writing this years later, and you know what he's trying to tell them? Hey guys, you can believe it. Know that this happened. And then he wanted you to know that even in the death of Jesus, Jesus was in control. I love the picture here. It says, after this, Jesus, knowing that all scripture, or, or knowing that all was now finished, he begins to give up his spirit. He's thirsty. They give him this sour wine on a branch. Then look at verse 30. When he had received it, Jesus said, he, it is finished. That word is to tell us die. It was a word used in accounting. Do you know what it meant? Many of you know what it means. It meant this, paid in full. They would stamp it when your debt was paid at the bank. And what it meant was this, that when Jesus Christ died on the cross, he paid the sin debt for all who will believe in him. That it's stamped on our record, paid in full for those who are his disciples. There's no extra work you have to do or I have to do. We're building a house right now. You know what day I look forward to is when the bank sends me a letter. You know what it's going to say? Paid in full. But you know what an even greater debt is? Not a mortgage. It's our sin debt. Our sin separated us from a holy God. But Jesus Christ came to this earth as a, as a man. He, he took on flesh and He walked a perfect sinless life. And yet we just read that He hung on the cross not for His sins, but for your sins and mine. It really happened. Even in His death, He was in control. Why? Because He went there purposefully. John said He gave up His Spirit. They didn't take it from Him. He gave up His Spirit. The crucifixion of Jesus is a historical fact. One, one thing that, that I want you to hear from this is, did you know even the most liberal, atheistic scholars in, 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 in colleges and universities and seminaries today, you know what? Even those who would say, I don't believe a word Jesus said, none of them will argue with that. That Jesus Christ was a real man who died on the cross. Bart Ehrman is one of those scholars, and he has, he's spent his life trying to disprove the words of Jesus, but he, he actually said this, one of the most certain facts of history is that Jesus was crucified on orders of the Roman prefect of Judea, Pontius Pilate. He said that is one of the most certain facts. He said, I can't disprove that. I can't disprove it. So Jesus died on the cross. Truth number two is this, John 19, 38 through 42. Look at it. Jesus was buried in a tomb. This is after these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and took away his body. Nicodemus also, who earlier had come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. So they took the body of Jesus, they bound it in linen cloths with the spices, as is the burial customs of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and, the, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one has yet been laid. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. If you look at this text, John gives specific names. John gives specific details on the burial of Jesus. Why would he mention Joseph of Arimathea? Why would he mention Nicodemus? Because these were well-known people in those days. You know what he's doing? He's saying, hey... You don't believe me? Go ask people that know Joseph. Go ask Nicodemus' family. They were there. These were well-known people. If he was just going to make up a story, he would have used some, some obscure name, but he wanted them to know this really happened. Jesus Christ died on the cross. You know what, guys? He was buried in a tomb. Joseph took his body. Nicodemus got spices. And John wants his readers to know that because he wants them to know this is true. And he wants them to believe. He wants them to believe. Can you imagine on, on that Friday when they put Jesus' body in the tomb? And then Saturday's there, the, the Sabbath day, and they're just waiting. Think about what the disciples would have thought. What happened? What did we do wrong? Are they going to come for us now? 
Think about the, the, the struggle that would have happened for, 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 for those days while Jesus laid in this tomb. We just saw our Savior die. Where do we go now, Lord? What do we do now? Praise God, the story doesn't end there. Because we see Jesus Christ died on a cross. John is making a historical, accurate statement. He was buried in a tomb. Here, go check with Joseph. Go check with Nicodemus' family. You know those guys. They were there. <laughs> but the third truth is this. It's even hard for me to say. Jesus rose from the dead. Jesus rose from the dead. Look at John 20. The, the text is built to this point. The whole gospel builds to this point. Jesus has made these incredible statements. I'm the bread of life. I'm the good shepherd. I lay down my life. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. I am the, the resurrection and the life. And it, it builds to this point where now Jesus has died. He's in a tomb at the end of chapter 19. But then, praise God for chapter 20. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. That's how John referred to himself. So she went to Peter and John and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb. We do not know where they have laid Him. So Peter went out with the other disciple and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together. The other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. I love that. It's like a race. And John said, hey, you know what? I'm faster than Peter. It's just funny. And stopping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there, and the face cloth, which has been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, went in. He saw and he believed. For as yet they did not understand the Scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stood to look into the tomb. She saw two angels in white <coughs> excuse me, sitting where the body of Jesus had lain. One at the head, one at the feet. They said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, they have taken away my Lord. I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where have you laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabbani, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father, and your Father to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his sides, his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Can you imagine Mary walking to the tomb? She's going there early that morning to see what had happened, to, to go anoint his body, and all of a sudden she gets there and the stones rolled away. She freaks out, right? Where are they taking them? She runs, she tells Peter and John, they have a race to the tomb. John's faster than Peter. He's got a really good 40 time, I bet. Okay? He gets there. He stops. Peter gets there. He don't stop. Peter never stops, right? Boom! He goes in. John comes in. They see this scene. The clothes are there. The towel's folded. And then John said at that moment, he began to believe. Up until then, he didn't really understand. But John said, at that moment, I began to understand. So they left, and Mary's outside. She still doesn't know what happened, and, and she's weeping. Ladies, are you an ugly crier? Anybody an ugly crier? 
Mary probably was an ugly crier. She's out there. Jesus comes up and she doesn't even recognize him. I bet the tears are there. I bet she's just snotty. She doesn't know what's happened. She's just wiping all this away. And this guy starts talking to her. And she's like, where'd you take him? Are you the gardener? I'll go get him. And then all of a sudden, you know what? Jesus speaks her name. Probably a name he said so many times. And in a way that only he could. And at that moment, he speaks her name. And you know what? Mary recognizes who it is. Jesus. Jesus. You're alive. And she clings. Can you imagine the embrace? She clings to him. And Jesus says, don't cling to me yet. She, he says, I'm going to go to the Father. He says, here's what you're going to do. Go tell my disciples. Go tell them what's happened. And she goes and she says, I've seen the Lord. I've seen him. And the disciples are there. They're locked in a room. They're scared the Jews are going to come after, after them. And, and so they're locked in this room. And then, boom, John says, Jesus just appeared. How cool is that? He just got in this locked room. And he's there. And he begins to speak. And he begins to show them what? His wounds. His scars. Why would he do that? He's testifying to them. I've defeated death. It's me. It's me. It's me. I've risen from the dead. Do you get it now? Do you get it now? Do you get it now? Jesus Christ rose from the dead. John gives eyewitnesses accounts to the empty tomb. Mary was the first eyewitness. Some say that the disciples made this up. Do you know that? There's some people that say that. But you know what? That is crazy to think about. In those days, you know what, a woman, and I'm not saying this, this was just historical, in those days, a woman's testimony was not valid in court. Do you know that? A woman's testimony was not valid in court. And so if John was making this up, it wouldn't have been Mary that would have been first. But he's writing this. He wants you to understand this really happened. Mary was the first eyewitness. And, and then Peter and John get there, and I love this. The tomb is not in disarray. It's not as if someone robbed it. It's not someone came and stole his body. And that's what some said about the, the resurrection. Well, all his disciples just stole his body. But John makes sure you know, hey, it's, it's, not, it's not a disarray. It's not, it's not chaos. It's not the room of a three- or four-year-old where everything's thrown. You know what I'm talking about? He said this, the, the, the cloths were there. The towel was folded. There's order there. And John said this, then I begin to understand that he must rise. He, he, then I begin to understand that he would rise from the dead. The, the resurrection of Jesus is a historical fact. Just as his crucifixion was a historical fact, the resurrection of Jesus is a historical fact. Jesus rose from the dead. You look at the disciples and you see their, their lives and how they were willing to die for this truth that Jesus is Lord. Many of them died a martyr's death. They were killed because they knew Jesus was worth it because He rose from the dead. That's truth number three. Truth number four is very simply, we've already seen it. Jesus appeared to his disciples and many others. If you stop in verse 10, it's a cliffhanger. What, what would happen next? But John gives great detail. He tells about Mary and Jesus in the garden. He tells about Jesus going into the, the, the locked room with his disciples. He, he shows them this. His readers can, can understand what he's talking about. Jesus shows them his hands, his side. He gives proof. Proof that Jesus is alive. So the disciples' fear turns to gladness, John says, because Jesus came and spoke peace over them. Luke's account said at this time that Jesus opened their eyes. I love this verse. He opened their eyes to show them in Scripture how all of it pointed to Him. How all of it pointed to Him. Did you know the whole Bible was pointing to this? That God was going to send a rescuer that would come and, and die for our sins, but then defeat death. That's Jesus. And he appeared to his disciples and many others. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, he appeared to his disciples and over 500 other people. 
Why would he say that? Because he wants you to know, guys, this is true. This is true. So John Mark, why do you keep going over this? Well, here's the last truth. Here's the last truth. Jesus Christ then sent out his disciples to continue his mission. Look at verse 21 through 23. Verse 21 through 23 says this. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. When he said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit, a a promise of what was going to come in Acts. He says, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. So he reinforces what he told them way back in Matthew chapter 16, where Matthew says that he gives them the keys of the kingdom, the gospel. In the same way that the Father sent him, Jesus, the risen Savior, is now telling his followers, I am sending you to continue this mission. I'm sending you to continue this mission. What's next for these disciples? In his appearance to them, Jesus gives purpose. Jesus gives purpose. You are to continue my mission of making disciples to the ends of the earth. That's what Matthew 28 says. That's what the end of Luke says. The end of Mark has it in there as well. And all of these followers of Jesus, they're they're echoing this truth where Jesus now, the the risen Lord, is telling his followers, go and continue what I'm doing. Continue living on my mission. There's a huge statement that that we're going to close with I want to remind you of. It's the next slide. It says, the validation of the claims of Christ forces us to a decision today. Okay? So, John Mark, what in the world does that mean? Here's what it means. When Adeline came to me and said, there's a a snake in the fireplace, and then later her truth was validated, I was forced into a decision as a father. I had to go and apologize to my daughter and tell her, I'm sorry, I didn't believe you. That, That truth changed me on a very small level. Do you see what I'm saying? But today we've talked about the truth of Easter. Because Jesus died on a cross, because he was buried in a tomb, because he rose from the dead, and there were men and women who saw his body, saw his scars, that forces us to a decision. And the decision is this. Will we surrender to him as Lord? See, the disciples' lives were radically changed. Why? Because they surrendered to Jesus as Lord. Can I tell you something? There's been a lot of religious men that have walked this earth. Think about it. All the religions in the world have a, have a leader they point back to. And you know what? All of them died. And you know what? Jesus died too. But can I tell you this this morning? Everybody hold your finger up. There's only one empty tomb. There's only one empty tomb. And because Jesus is who he said he is and did what he said he would do, he died on the cross for your sins and for mine, and he defeated death by rising again on the third day, we have a decision to make today. For some of you, it's this. For some of you, it's turning from your sin, realizing that your sin has separated you from God. And you deserve hell and death. But Jesus came that you might have life. And your decision today is this. I'm going to confess my sins. And I'm going to trust in Jesus as Lord. If that's you today, I would love to talk to you about that. For some of you today, your decision is this. Jesus is Lord of my life. And the truths of Easter remind me that he has given me great purpose John 20, 21, just as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And some of you realize today that you've not been living for that mission. And today you need to come and say, Jesus, I'm giving you everything. You've defeated sin and death for me, and I'm going to give my life to you as a living sacrifice. I'm going to serve you with everything I've got. Why? 
Because you're worth it. Because you're worth it. I pray today you're like Mary. Maybe you're sitting there and you're in the garden and you're, you're all teary-eyed and you don't really know what's going on. And I pray right now in this moment, I pray this, I pray you hear Jesus speak your name. Mary. Mary. And you look and you see this morning our risen Lord. Our risen Lord. And you're obedient to what he calls you to do. And we pray for us. Father, we thank you for the truth of your word. God, we love you and we praise you for the empty tomb. God, I, I thank you for, for your grace and your mercy. God, that, that you and my sin looked down on me with love and you sent your son so that I might have life. And I pray today if there's one who's never trusted in Christ, they will see that Jesus is who he said he is, the bread of life, the light of the world, the good shepherd, the door, the way, the truth, and the life, the resurrection and the life. And he did what he said he'd do. He died for our sins. And he rose again, defeating death. And Lord, I pray today that we surrender. Whatever that is, whatever step of obedience you call us to, that we will surrender to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.